All right, Obadiah. Was Obadiah a prophet? Yep. He wrote. He Is wrote. that like prophet sharing? <laughs> no, no, not really. I'm going to try an experiment for us today. And um, we're going to read through this. And then we are going to, what I want you to try to do with all your strength is pretend like you only have 21 verses of the Bible, period. This, you don't have the rest of the Bible. We don't have any historical data. We don't have any commentaries. All Pretend like all we've got from God is this book of Obadiah, these 21 verses, okay? Try to shut out every other thing. And this is what we've got. Okay, that's that's the first pass we're going to take. Try to shut out all these other things and say this is what we've got. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. All right. It might be hard. We're not used to doing that, no. but <clears throat> all right. So I'm going to start Obadiah one as it, as is our habit. You read a single verse at a time. You say the name of the verse you're you're reading, and uh, we'll go this way today. Uh, Obadiah one. The vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up. Let us rise against her for battle. Uh, two. See, I will make you a I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly depressed. Three. The pride of your heart has deceived you, and you will live in the, in the cliff of the rocks and make your home on the heights. You who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Four. Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Five, if thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen gatherers, no, stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? Six, <clears throat> but how Esau will be ransacked, his hidden treasures pillaged. Seven, all the men allied with you, will send you forth to the border, and the men at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They who eat your bread will set an ambush for you. There is no understanding in him. <coughs> Eight, in that day, declares the Lord, I will destroy the wise men of Edom, men of understanding in the mountains of Esau. Nine, your warriors, O Teman, will be terrified, and everyone in Esau's mountains will be cut down in the slaughter. Ten, for violence against your brother Jacob, <clears throat> shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. Eleven, for the day you stood aloof, while strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gates, and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. Twelve, you should not gloat over your brother. In the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. 13. <clears throat> Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity nor have laid hands on their sub substance in the day of their calamity. 14. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. 15. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, I will be, it will be done to you. Your your deeds will return upon your own head. 16. Just as you drank on my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. 
they will drink and drink, and it, and as if they had never been. 17. But on the Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy, and the house of Jacob will possess his inheritance. 18. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them. There's more. Oh, <laughs> devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken of. 19. From the Negev, people from the Negev will occupy the mountains of Esau, and the people from the foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. And the exiles of this host of the sons of Israel, who are among the Canaanites as far as Serapath, and the exiles of Jerusalem, who are in Sepharad, will possess the cities of the Negev. 21. Deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. All right. So we are, uh, we're trying an experiment. Um, Ms. Artis and Larry, we are trying to, on this first pass, pretend like the only knowledge we have about the Bible is just these 21 verses. So we're trying to limit ourselves completely to just what's here. We're not trying to chase rabbits outside in history and all these other things. Okay. So with that in mind, what kind of literature is this? I mean, we've done... Prophecy. It's a prophecy, right? So it's not portraying itself as history necessarily. It's not necessarily portraying itself as wisdom literature, right? It's not portraying itself as uh, just straight narrative, okay? Okay. So what, what's the big deal here? If you were to summarize what's going on in these 21 verses. And Obadiah is the... Oh, I'm already going outside. Uh, okay, what's the big deal? God's going to destroy Esau. God's going to destroy Esau. Okay? Is that, yeah. is that the flavor of the whole... Is that, you, you, take, you eat this passage and you say, mm, sound tastes like judgment. Right? Tastes like judgment. Okay, so judgment's the theme... And why? Why the judgment? Not obeying God. Well, that is ultimately the the, the reason. But how is <coughs> how is it? Um, they were not nice to God's people, Jacob's. They were not nice to <laughs> his his people. Abraham's yeah, they, they took advantage of, of yeah. Judah when it was uh, suffering difficulties. Okay. They used that as an excuse to attack and deprive them of okay. things. So the first chunk here, um, we might say from like one to nine, okay? Uh, Obadiah is going to prosecute a case against Edom. And it doesn't matter at this point who Edom is, the deal is Obadiah is going after him because God's going after him. Is that why Esau's name is mentioned so many times? Why? As if uh, be, being judgmental? What's that? Esau's name. In, uh, I think it was mentioned four or five times. Esau? Yeah. 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 And these are the descendants of Esau. Yeah. The Edomites. They're the, they're the descendants of Esau. Okay. Yeah. All right, we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. Okay, so this case is being prosecuted against Edom. And uh, what is the reason there in verse 3? They're very arrogant. And they think that no one can touch them. Who can bring them down to earth? <laughs> okay, so... They were, so they were proud. They were proud. They were proud. Seeking, yeah. Okay. 
So if, if, all, if the only thing we ever knew about God was from these 21 verses, we would know one thing at least, right? Not to be proud. <laughs> right? Okay? And so the pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rocks. And so he says there that he's going to bring some judgment on them. So there in verse 5, If thieves came to you, if plunderers came by night, how you would have been destroyed, would they not steal only enough for themselves? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? The implication there is, when I come for judgment, you know, if a thief came and got into your fort, they're going to be quick, they're going to grab some stuff and leave, and leave some stuff. When I come, it's I'm sweeping the house clean. Right? Okay. Um, so he's, he's going after them for their pride. Okay. And what were some of the, uh, what were some of the particular acts that he's going after them for? This is in verse 10. And the violence against your brother Jacob. Violence against your brother Jacob. So who is Jacob's brother? Esau. 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 Okay. Okay. So Edom. Esau. Uh, I thought I would try this experiment where we're trying to, to stay here, but it's hard to stay here. <laughs> because but here's the thing. Here's the, here's the reason I wanted to try this. Um, I started into this and I was like, oh boy. And what I don't want you to think is that you, you if, uh, what I don't want you to, th- what I'm trying, <laughs> <laughs> what I don't want you to think is, oh, there's minor prophets, I got to do so much digging and there's so much I don't know, I, I should just avoid them. Okay? Because uh, the scriptures tell us that, that the, the entire Word of God is useful for rebuke, training in righteousness, correction, and exhortation, right? So what I don't want you to say about the minor prophets is, ah, it's a little bit too dense. Because what happens is you start reading and you start asking these questions. And if, you, if you're like me, you start asking so many questions that you're like, and you never get to the end of it. So what I was trying to do at the beginning of this is say, you can learn a ton of stuff without chasing all your questions. Don't let your questions bog you down. Because what we've seen here so far is that God doesn't like pride, right? I just just wasn't able to make the connections very well. My experiment has failed here today. (laughs) Um, But, so, these minor prophets, you know, uh, I guess my encouragement is, there's enough here. Well, let me ask you this. At the end of the day, is it more important probably to know that uh, we shouldn't be prideful or that we know where the Negev is? If you had to choose between the two, right? That's what I'm getting at. If you had to choose between the two, is it more important that I learn where the Negev is or that I learn what pride is and try to avoid it? Right. Okay. So that's what I'm getting at with this experiment, right? All right. So... uh, (laughs) Well, you know, it's With funny, um, this morning our son came over before he visited, and I told him last week we were going to study Obadiah. So he said to me this morning, Mom, I read that two pages. <laughs> he said, it's very confusing. He said, I said, well, that's why I'm going to Bible school. <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain it to you when I get home. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's... Well, I know what I'm trying to say is that, you know, you don't have... I'm, so part of my job is to help you understand things, but part of my job is to also help you learn how to read the Scriptures for yourself. Mm-hmm. And so, again, one of my themes is when you, when you start reading through stuff and you have a bunch of questions, look for the things that you know that you know. Right? Don't let your questions bog you down so much that you're just like, minor prophets, I tried it for 10 minutes one day and it was, I'm out of here. Right? Because at the this, Go ahead. To sum this whole 
book over there is uh, I see Micah chapter 6 verses 8 to sum it what's in here. Yeah. Uh, uh, what, is the, what is Micah 6 8? It, it's... it says, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It helped me when I looked it up, though. I looked up for the Bible, it says. Yeah. And Edomites were proud and self-seeking. Yeah. So, uh, so we'll go ahead and blow everything wide open. We will not try this in three layers, okay? I thought, I thought it, I, it was an interesting experiment. We will abandon that experiment. All right, so we'll go back up at the top. The vision of, of Obadiah, so it says right there it's a vision, okay? So this is a prophetic oracle. And he, uh, what's, when Obadiah is writing this down, and Obadiah, there are a number of Obadiahs. Um, it's kind of hard to nail down which Obadiah this was. And do we get any hint from the text itself on timing? Um, so, for instance, uh, it might be one of the, it's either Matthew or Luke, it said in, uh, during the well, there there are times that the text will give you some clues about when they are in history. So does this does Obadiah give us any internal clues as to when it was written? And if they do, it's usually up at the beginning. So, for instance. Um, Here's an example of when you get an internal clue for time. Let me find it here. Uh, Isaiah, the vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah the son of Amoz saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So if you could figure out when in history those kings ruled, then you would figure out when Isaiah was writing. Okay? Mm -hmm. We don't have that here in Obadiah, do we? No. It's just coming. So um, they have to try to they have to try to figure out dates for this. And the most plausible date, well, if you were to go about trying to figure out a date, what kind of clues would you look for here in this text to try to help you figure out a date? <laughs> my Bible it says that uh, between eight fifty three and eight forty one BC. Mine says 605. <laughs> 605 to 586. Does anybody else have any different dates in your... Mine says 855 to 840 BC. Mine okay. says 853 to 84. Okay. So that's like 300 years difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. What, what, what described in here would help us find a date? Towards the end, when it's talking about the exiles who are among the Canaanites and the exiles who are in Sepharad. <clears throat> okay. Okay, we could look there. Where else? It said something about hand over the survivors. Okay, go back a few more verses. Around verse 11. Yeah, it sounds like someone else uh, attacked Jerusalem and the Edomites sort of piled on. Okay, so that's what's going on, right? So if we were to look for, to try to date it, we would have to date it. We'd have to look in the history books for when Jerusalem got attacked. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of Which time? things in there. Hmm? Which time? That's right, there are a number of things. So some of the 800... Uh, the 800 number gets comes up. The 586, 587 number comes up. Um, it's hard to tell, but the point is, is that when Jerusalem was attacked, who didn't help them? Edom. Edom. All right. Now we'll do Edom. Who was Edom? Uh, Esau. Edom are the descendants of Esau. <coughs> so Edom means red. 
Do you remember the story about Esau and Jacob? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Their brothers? Right. What was well, the... you said we don't have the rest of the Bible. Well, I, I, I abandoned that, right? <laughs> I, got, I got a few... I was like, this will be an interesting oh, experiment for about eight minutes, and then we'll get out of there. Um, and he, he had red hair. Yeah. Esau was... Yeah. 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 So we know the story about Jacob and Esau. So this is an ancient kind of division, right? I mean, certainly, whenever it was written, it was ancient, but... So this is a family history deal, right? So Jacob and Esau, um, and Esau comes across like adult, right? Because he sells his inheritance for stew, and then uh, and then then he gets swindled, right? And then so you can read about the history of Jacob and Esau in Genesis. But that's what this is going back to. So Edom are the, in Obadiah's day, they're the descendants of Esau. So when Jerusalem comes to get attacked, the, this is verse 10, the violence done to your brother Jacob, because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. Okay? On the day that you stood aloof, that's verse 11. What's, what's everybody else got there? They stood aloof. Stood aloof. Everybody got stood aloof? What do you got? What have you got there, Larry? Have you got New King James? Uh, oh, yeah. Not Larry, sorry. And the day that you stood on the other side, huh. Yeah, mm. stood on the other side. So part of the indictment was is that Jerusalem was getting attacked and Edom didn't come to help them. And not only did they not come to help them, when he's prosecuting the case here, what three things, what four things does he charge Edom with there from 10 to 14? Violence, first off, against his brother, Jacob. Okay. What else? He allowed him to be destroyed. Yeah, he stood aloof. Stood aloof. The what happens in verse 12? They rejoiced, they rejoiced over them. They rejoiced over them that they were getting attacked. Yeah. Okay, what else? God wiped them out. They boasted. They boasted. They, boasted. Mm-hmm. they rejoiced over their calamity. They boasted. What they do in verse 13, the last part? They gloated. They looted. They gloated. They gloated. They gloated. They gloated. They gloated. But also looted. Oh, looted. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. So not only did they stand stand on the other side, stood aloof when the city was being attacked, they didn't come to help. They were glad. They rejoiced over the misfortune of Jacob, the people of Judah. Their hatred made them want to destroy them. Yeah, when the attackers left, they came in and rounded up everything else. And then what they do in verse 14? They handed over the future just the ones that yeah. were captured. They sold them to the enemy. So the people that were trying to flee, they rounded them up and sold them off to the enemy. So that's what the problem is. So that's the problem. So Edom, pride in their heart. In the uh, so judgment is going to come against them because of <coughs> the violence done to their brother Jacob. Now the interesting thing here is in the sovereignty of the Lord, <laughs> uh, the attack came against Jerusalem because of the people's sinfulness. So again here, we've got the Lord drawing straight with crooked lines and sweeping clean with dirty brooms. Okay? All right? So the pride... So so let's go back up a little bit to the top. So that's the deal. The city has been attacked and Esau stood by and didn't help because Esau was not his brother's what? Keeper. 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 Right? Esau was not his brother's keeper. Now, 
given what we know about Jacob and Esau, would it be would it surprise you? No. That Esau would not want to be his brother's keeper? Because Jacob was well, Jacob a robbed his scoundrel, <laughs> right? Yeah. He was yeah. a scoundrel. He he sold the birthright for some stew. And he got in league with his mom to steal the blessing. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that right there. The fact that God chose Jacob above Esau. It wasn't because of Jacob's stellar character, was it? No. Esau also fell for Jacob's ploy uh, when uh, Jacob was journeying back from uh, where he was with Laban, and Esau went after Jacob with uh, 400 armed men. And so there was the tension there that Esau probably wanted to kill him. Yeah. But uh, Jacob, you know, sent everything in front of him, like all his people and his servants and everything, he said, they're, they're yours, they're yours. And then he and his family, you know, scampered. Yeah, Jacob is not a stellar character guy, right? Now, that's not an excuse for us to be a bunch of scoundrels as Christians, right? We can't, we can't you know, live like the devil and say, well, God chose Jacob. Well, God chose Jacob in spite of all that stuff, right? Not because of all that stuff. It's not, all that stuff is good. All right, so, <coughs> so for the pride of your heart, has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks, this is verse 3, in your lofty dwellings, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? So the land of Edom is to the south of, in the south of Israel, and it is a rocky, craggy, hilly area. Have you all been there? Have you you've been there? That's where the ancient city of Petra is. I don't know if you know that. I've heard about that, but it's in the, and so there's, there's a, there's an entrance, it's, it's fortified, it's a fortified place, there's an ancient, um, ancient uh, fortress there at En Salah, Es Salah, and in order to get to it, you had to go through this little winding canyon, so if you were at the end of the canyon where your fortress was, I think I read one thing that said like 12 people could hold off an army because everything had to go through this pinch point, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was part of Edom's pride was that they had this fortified area in the hills and you walk up and there's all these little caves and stuff where people lived and hid and all this stuff. And so that's part of the pride. You who live in the clefts of the rock in your lofty dwelling. So to get up to that fortress, you had to go through this pinch point. And so that's a real, that, you know, that's a geographic, um, that's one of the reasons that they would be proud. They would be uh, almost like, uh, what was the, uh, what was the Titanic? Unsinkable. Uh, unsinkable, yeah. right? Mm. Right? Unless you've been out in the big blue. <laughs> Nothing is unseekable out there. Yeah, yeah. So their pride said, who will bring me down to the ground? Uh, Can you think of another Bible pride that was similar to that? About loftiness? Can you think of another Bible, old, old Bible story about pride? Goes just before the fall. Hmm? Pride goes just before the fall. It does, it does, absolutely. Uh, God put Adam and Eve in the garden. He said, spread out, fill the earth. The fall happens. They start spreading out, filling the earth. And then they all gather together at a tower. Right? And they're going to... And God has told them to spread out and fill the earth. And they said, no, we're going to be here. We're going to have one language. We're going to build a tower right up to the sky. Right, we're gonna we're gonna get up there by God. So that's another ancient symbol of pride, the Tower of Babel. Right? Who will bring me down to the ground? And that's um, that's a common refrain in prophetic things about people being brought low. 
Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Verse 4. So Obadiah is indicting Edom to say, no matter how high you think you are, you are never so high that the Lord can't bring you down from where you are. Because the reality is, Tower of Babel folks were going to build a tower up to the sky and it says the Lord came down to see what they were doing. Right? They thought they were doing this great thing and the Lord's like, what, what's, what's going on down there? So Edom, in her pride, thought that she was untouchable. And there in verse 5, if thieves came to you, if plunderers came by night, how you would have been destroyed. Uh, so 5 and 6 there is a description of how total the devastation will be when the Lord comes to judge them. We've touched on it before. And then verse 7, all your allies have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They've prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. Meaning, whoever else you were in league with, they've all turned on you at this point. By the time the Lord comes to judge you, you're not going to have any friends. <laughs> okay. How Esau has been pillaged, his treasure sought out. It says at the end of verse eight, end of verse seven, you have no understanding. And then what does he what does he do to those people who thought they had understanding in verse eight? <coughs> He's going to destroy the wise man. You have no understanding. You, your wise man think you're wise, but I'm going to destroy that. <coughs> so that's the prosecution, the first section. And it's about the pride. And we're never outside of God's reach when it comes to our pride. And so Jacob did not come to the rescue of his brothers, Esau. Excuse me, the other way around. Esau did not come to Jacob's. They stood aloof. And here's an interesting thing there in verse 11. Uh, by their inaction, what are they charged with? Yeah. It might as well have been as if they had done it. Mm -hmm. So he's, the Lord's holding them responsible, as responsible as the people who actually came and attacked the city. Because they stood apart, they stood aloof, they didn't help. Okay. Okay, so then he prosecutes the case, gives the gives the evidence. You've been prideful. You think you're beyond the reach of God? No. When when the day of the Lord comes, it's going to be terrible. Um, you stood by when your brother Jacob was being attacked. Not only did you stand by, you gloated. You did a little dance. Dance. <laughs> um, and, and I think there there might be a proverb about that that says when your enemy gets brought low, don't rejoice too much or something. There's a proverb that's kind of like that. Has anybody read that one? Okay. Um, and so we land in verse 15. For the day of the Lord is near upon all nations. What is the day of the Lord? I think uh, the uh, final judgment. Yeah, the final judgment. Judgment. Yeah. judgment. judgment. Yeah. Generically, it's judgment. Yeah. So I, I think there might be if you if you go to a Bible software and you search for day of the Lord, you will show up. <laughs> I think maybe a dozen or more. So. Certainly there is the day of the Lord. Usually when we talk about it, 
Um, we think the day of the Lord, meaning the final judgment. That, so what I sometimes say is the separation of the sheep and the goats, that judgment. Separation of sheep and goats, the final, 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 final judgment. But in a lot of these prophetic literature, there is the day of the Lord, simply meaning the Lord coming in judgment. Because you remember what the day of the Lord was in Joel? Remember when we went through Joel, what the day of the Lord was? It's Pentecost. Right? When the Lord brings the Spirit, the day of the Lord. So, all that is to say is there are a number of days of the Lord. So when you read day of the Lord in your Old Testament and in your New Testament, you kind of, kind of got to do a little bit of work to try to figure out uh, the context. Because not everything... Certainly, um, judgments in the short term. So this, this day of the Lord that's talked about here is an appetizer of the final, final, final day of the Lord. Right? But it's not the final day of the Lord. All right? And so the last half of that verse, somebody tell me what's going on there. For as the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations... And then what's the next thing talking about here? What they did that will be done to them. Yeah. What they did will be done to them. What's, uh, what is, what's, it, in legal terms, what, 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 what might we call that? Retribution. Yes, it is. Okay, retribution. retribution. What else? Is it reciprocity? Reciprocity is a fabulously good word. Reciprocity. One of the few I know. <laughs> Reciprocity. Uh, when you do something to somebody and nothing happens to you as a result, we say that's a miscarriage of justice. justice right? Okay. Likewise, if someone... Uh, takes somebody's toothpick, if I come and steal Don's toothpick out of his house, and he comes and he uh, chops both of my legs off, we would say, that's a little much, right? That's not just either. So here, uh, we might say that the punishment fits the crime here. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. The punishment fits the crime. <clears throat> so the Lord will exact justice on uh, Edom for the same thing that they have done. So whatever the plunderers left around after plundering Jerusalem the Edomites came in and took and swept it clean. So that's what it's talking about here in verse 5. Right? We talked about it a little bit earlier. You picked up the dregs, so we're going to get, when the Lord comes, everything that you did, it's going to be done to you. Okay? Is that the phrase that goes around, comes around? <laughs> That is. And, and this gets in a little, uh, in modern times, uh, and we'll delve into a little uh, talk about Eastern, Eastern mysticism. What, uh, what, what's kind of a concept that people talk about that's along those lines? Karma. Karma. Okay. I'm not an advocate of karma. Um, Chiefly because uh, for Christians, we don't get what we deserve, <laughs> right? But there is a biblical thing that says, as you have done it, it shall be done to you. So it's, it's yeah. So artists. that brings to mind, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. So the Just inverse turn of that. It inside out. So the inverse of that is the golden rule. Mm -hmm. Edom, if you were to be attacked, would you have liked Jacob to come to your aid? Of course. Yes. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right? Okay. 
Then verse 16 there, For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow and shall be as though, as though they had never been. That was a little bit dense for me. <laughs> Does anybody have any thoughts there? Well, the, uh, historically, the Edomites disappear as a people uh, going in the future. Yeah. Yeah, the Edomites disappear. Yeah. Uh, so that statement there, for you, uh, as you have drunk on my holy mountain, meaning these crimes you have committed against Jerusalem, so too the nations will come and commit these against you to such a degree, you know, if you were drinking, you'd drink yourself out of existence. That kind of thing. Okay? Then uh, somebody talked to me about what happens in verse 17. Jacob possesses inheritance. Jacob shall, shall possess their possession. Deliverance. So, when the Lord's people get carted off to exile, is that the end of it for them? He brings them back. Because they're wonderful? No. no. Because he's wonderful. Because he's wonderful. Because they promise they're going to do what he says? No. no, because he promised to do what he says. Right? I mean, there's an, there's an interesting thing in one of the prophets where he says, not, not, it's for my name's sake that I'm going to do this. Right? Uh, again, historically, um, after the Romans destroyed uh, Jerusalem, um, a lot of the Jews scattered, and they call that the Great Diaspora. And they went, you know, into Europe and stuff like that, and, and some other places. And basically, Israel as a nation ceased to exist until the modern era in uh, '48, when they became a, a nation again. Mm -hmm. And the, that was the miracle that a lot of people point to is the fact that Israel had been dispersed amongst all the countries and everything, but. After the events of, especially after the events of World War II, they they came back, and and God gave them a, their land again. That is, that is certainly one of the views on that for sure. Um, yeah, God has has a way of uh, even even their people and their sin taking responsibility for their sin, bearing the judgment for their sins. He doesn't abandon his people. He doesn't abandon his people. And, uh, and I will say that, you know, this is kind of a, a drum that I beat quite often, that the founding of Israel in 1948 was vastly different than the founding of Israel at the base of Mount Sinai. I mean, there's a vast difference. I have a question since yeah. you studied the Bible in your uh, college years to become a pastor. I, I always ask this question, if God made Edom disappear in, this, in the earth, the hatred of the Arabs towards Israel, who are the Arabs? I think they're the Ishmaelites. Ishmael on down you've to got, today. You've got Isaac and, uh, you've got, yeah, Isaac and Ishmael, and Ishmael are the are they, uh, the Islamic, uh, okay. yeah. Uh, Islamic Muslims, because their hatred never ends. I mean, it's there to this day. Yeah, and it's, it's a testament to human folly that grudges like that go on for a thousand years or two thousand or more, years or whatever. Right. Yeah. Or more. They seem to teach their children that hatred. They pass it from generation to generation. So I have a friend that is from Iran. She's not a believer. Her husband is a believer. In fact, a Bible. He's, he's he can be like a minister, and she still speak ill about Israel. And I said, I cannot believe how people hate. Well, given their current events going on there, it's understandable. You know. I mean, when I get angry with somebody. After 
that anger subside, I said, oh, God, forgive me, and I forgive that person. <laughs> but these people are... Yeah, yeah it, is, it, it never is goes a, away. It is an ancient grudge. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I always think that if, it, if, if Abraham had trusted God, it wouldn't have happened. <laughs> because he didn't trust, and so he played with Haggai and had the first son, and then Isaac. So it just set up the... It was, yeah, not the son of the promise. Mm -hmm. Not the son of the promise. Ms. Artis? I believe we have to go back to Abraham. Because Abraham received the land from God. God said, this, this is your land. God doesn't change his mind. No. So that land is their land. Forever. God doesn't change his mind. <coughs> That's what I believe. Right, so where were we? Uh, oh, the house of Jacob uh, shall possess their own possessions. So verse 18. Uh, oh, so we're talking about the remnant. The remnant. Yes. The remnant. And see, even... So there is a... Nest, nested within the ethnic people of Israel is a people of... of uh, who not only share Abraham's DNA, but also share his faith. And that's the real key. That's right. It's not necessarily, it's certainly not whether you have Abraham's DNA, it's whether you have Abraham's faith. So there is nested within the ethnic nation a grouping of people that are faithful. Right? And so all the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees didn't believe in Jesus, but they probably had Abraham in their DNA. Yeah. But they're a problem. <laughs> that's a problem. Right? Okay, so, so that's the notion of the remnant. And Paul talks about the remnant in, uh, in um, Romans as well. So the Lord will always have this grouping of people that are faithful to Him. Okay, so um, the house, but in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, the remnant, and it shall be holy. Mount Zion shall be holy. Um, and the house of Jacob shall, shall possess their own possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau a stubble. <laughs> so, so one's going to consume the other one. There should be no survivor for the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. So that's what Larry talked about. That, that, that grouping of people has, has been uh, eradicated. Then uh, 19 talks about uh, those of the Negev shall possess Mount Esau. Now, the, all you need to know there is that Esau is not possessing Esau; that somebody else is possessing the Esau, right? Mm -hmm. So Who that's is there now. Huh? What and what part of the world is there? Is that's Jordan area. Okay. I think is that right? <coughs> Geography isn't my strong suit by any by any stretch, but it's it's Edom. You know, all that stuff south of Jerusalem in the Jordan area. So if you look at like where Petra is now, that's in the Jordan. In Jordan. Uh, but the point there in 19, again, it doesn't, what doesn't, uh, those in the Negev shall possess Mount Esau. Well, the point is, Esau doesn't possess Mount Esau. That's the point, whether you know where that is or not. Those of the Shephelah shall possess the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim, the land of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of the host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sephard shall possess the cities in the Negev. Saviors or deliverers shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So that's kind of where we are. It's, it's a dense thing. It's, uh, you, have to, you have to dig in. But... And what I want to kind of get back to is, even if you didn't have um, all the historical stuff, and even if you didn't have... So, I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted here. When you read a text of stuff, don't get wigged out by the stuff you don't know. Look for the stuff you can know, right? And then, branch out. So... 
Um, if we would have just done that, we would have said there's a problem with Edom. They were prideful. They didn't help their brother. Uh, they will receive judgment, and it will the punishment will fit the crime. Then you can go back and say, well, who's Edom? Well, Edom is Esau. Oh, Jacob and Esau. And then that'll add a little bit more understanding. Then you bring in the historical stuff, and that'll bring in the fullest understanding. But again, um, all the word is is sufficient for us. Okay. All right, final thoughts or questions? Obadiah was a little bit harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, I'm looking forward to Nehemiah being a little less, a little less dense. Uh, thoughts or questions there? All right, well, I'll pray for us. Uh, Father, we thank you for today and we thank you for your love towards us in the Lord Jesus Christ and we thank you that you are in the business of uh, sanctifying your name. We are thankful that you are in the business of calling people to be part of your family. Father, we're thankful that you have a way of uh, keeping hold of your people. We thank you that as your children, your adopted sheep into your family, that we are safe in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, our desire is that uh, no one would experience any kind of judgment. So, Father, we pray for nations and people around us that don't know you, that you would um, draw them to you by your word and through your spirit so that many more men, women, and children can come to know the Savior. And Father, those of us whom you have drawn, that you would keep us close, that you would keep us abiding in the vine, and that you would um, keep us away from pride, and that you would help us be our brother's keeper. So that's why we pray for the nations to come to know the Lord Jesus and our friends, our relatives, and even our enemies. Uh, We thank you for your word and your spirit. We we know that it is sufficient to guide us for life in this world. So Father, uh, give us understanding and wisdom through these minor prophets, uh, that we might uh, know you better, come to love you more, and trust your promises more, and serve our neighbors more. We thank you again for this day, and we pray that you would do the same thing for those that join us by video and have joined us in the past, uh, that you would do the same thing for them as well. And it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray these things. Amen and amen. Amen. All right. Thank you all.